Professor Falkingham, thank you very much for coming on to talk to us. No problem. Right. Uh, biomechanics. You're a biomechanist. What does that involve? What is biomechanics? Yeah, so I'm a paleontologist at heart, but I want to understand how extinct animals move. And to do that, I use modern animals uh, to understand how they move and, and the biomechanics of how organisms generally move, right? So biomechanics is the physics of living organisms. And that's not just animals, that's plants. So it could be how a branch responds to a weight on it, a bird perching or a monkey hanging from it. It could be how the legs of an animal support its weight. It could be how uh, a fish swims and moves its body so that it generates thrust and moves through water and the environment. Basically, it's the physics of living organisms. That is an incredibly broad subject. <laughs> and, and, you know, physics is everywhere. It's in everything. It's, and it, it must be different for, as you say, a, a branch of a tree versus a jellyfish or something like yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, physics has a whole bunch of different fields and you might not find a particle physicist you know, they're, they're going to be working on something completely different from somebody working on orbital physics. Uh, mm. It's all that the fundamental laws are the same. And in the same way, somebody working on the biomechanics of how dandelion seeds disperse in the wind is going to have a very different experience and skill set to somebody working on the biomechanics of how elephants move around. But there's common themes there, right? The, the, basically, the laws of physics determine what living animals, living plants, can do and how they can move, which then um, it all comes down to constraints. So those physical laws give you constraints on what evolution can do and where it can go, right? A flying animal can only get so big because you have to be able to generate enough lift to overcome weight times uh, mass times gravity, which is weight. You can't get around that. And so understanding the physics of flight means you can understand how and why flying animals evolve in a certain way, for instance. Yeah, what, what I want to get at there is, you know, like the scope of this is so large. So as a biomechanist, do you um, have a, a, a set little specialist area? You, you work on, for instance, how things fly. That is a career in, of a, in and of itself. Or as a biomechanist, do you look you say like the rules are the same for everything and you look at the whole fossil record and someone will come up to you and say oh well i need to understand how these uh mushroom spores drop out of mm. the cap of it and you can just apply what you know to any animal yeah that's a that's a really good question um so my specialty is is locomotion and i'm particularly interested in how dinosaurs and birds move there's evolutionary links there that make that very obvious. I'm interested in how their limbs interact with uh, muds and sands and things like that. But the skill set that comes from that and the sort of physics-based knowledge, that can spread. So I've worked with people on how plesiosaurs move through water. I've worked with people on how echinoderms work, move through water or sit there in, in a flow, for instance. Um, and I've even worked with people who are looking at uh, little defects in snail shells and how that affects the strength of the shell. So these are all biomechanical problems that use similar methods to answer them, but people tend to focus on a specific area of interest simply because, you know, there's only so much time in the world and we, we need to focus these things. Right. So um, you advised on the biomechanics for every episode of Life on Our Planet. And so if I have a look at a scene. In, in this instance, let's take our Lystrosaurus. Mm -hmm. the, the model, its shape, its behaviors, everything that it does on screen. How many biomechanical variables, considerations, constraints come into play when showing that? Like, How deep is the science involved? Yeah, so I mean, there's, there's masses and masses of literature on how animals move and how we understand that. Um, and it's more, more and more important, especially today, 
in this digital realm because you know if you were using a puppet or something the puppet has a mass and it needs to physically move around but when you've got a digital model it's you need to know what the constraints and the fundamentals are of motion of animal motion to to get it right so there's the joint angles the the range of motion right can it can it extend its limbs fully uh, does it extend its limbs fully to move it around how heavy is it? What is its mass? Where is the mass located? If it's near the back, that changes how much the back legs have to do versus the front legs. Um, how maneuverable is it? How stiff is the back? You know, things like that can matter for how the legs move. Uh, how stiff is the skin or does it have armor, right? These things are, are, these affect the way the rest of the animal moves and they can affect its speed and its gait and all these other things. So. Um, there's a whole bunch of things come into play. Uh, a lot of the ways we sort of look at it, though, is, is you look at modern animals and how they're moving and you construct the rules around it. And that's where a lot of the um, knowledge and sort of guidance comes through when looking at the, the reconstructions and the, and the digital models. Okay. Uh, so we've, we've got all the different animals in the show. And... We've spoken about the rules of physics being the same for every single mm -hmm. organism. So if we have one that is, uh, say, Triceratops, and we have a another organism that is very Triceratops-like in terms of size and mm -hmm. shape, uh, I don't can't think of a mammal off the top of my head, but I'm sure there's a big <laughs> quadruped or what? A rhino, there oh, we go. Rhino, yeah. That's a classic one. All right, so we've got them the same height, the same weight, can we make the assumption that they would move in the same way, that they'd have the same speed, for example? Or, or does every single organism need to be like considered and built up from the ground individually? Yeah, so um, there's sort of common principles across these things, right? If you take a, a, a big rhino and a triceratops, they both have a very large mass. And it's a fundamental law that force equals mass times acceleration. So if you're accelerating that mass, you have to generate a force. How much force you can generate depends on how much muscle there is. Um, and so that's going to determine the acceleration with which they move. So there's going to be similarities there. There's going to be the same constraints um, in the same way that two trucks would have a similar kind of acceleration versus two sports cars. Are going to be more similar to each other. But that being said, every animal is different to an extent. And once we're comparing between something like Lystrosaurus and mammals, things are very different. Um, and even within mammals, things are different. So I, I, I actually quite like to recount this story that when I started my postdoc some years ago, I went to work with Steve Gatesy, and my postdoc was going to be. How did, di how did dinosaurs and birds move differently from each other? And I kind of got there and I'm chatting with Steve, who's worked on birds for 30 years and how they move. And I said, oh, I'm going to look at how dinosaurs move differently to birds. And he sort of looked at me and said, oh, yeah, how do birds move? I'm like, what? I said, well, there's lots of birds and some of them move differently. And, and how do you quantify that? And how do they move over different substrates? And so it turns into this incredibly complex problem that every animal is moving slightly differently. So yeah, here we're looking at, um, you know, if we're looking at a dinosaur that's a similar size to a mammal today, we can get an idea of how that mass might be moved around. But the specifics of the limb motions and how it's driven and how maneuverable, and accel it, it, how maneuverable it is and how much acceleration it has, um, those things need to sort of come from first principles they need to come from the fossils, they need to come from the research into those organisms. So in this episode, we, we see a lot of um, different animals and they're all doing very different things. We see uh, pterosaurs, reptiles in flight. We see uh, reptiles, erythrosuchus, walking on different surfaces. We've got lizards walking on sand. Uh, we've got lizards in water, we've got marine reptiles swimming. Uh, how much of a role does the external environment play in determining the 
physical capabilities of an animal. Yeah, the external environment is sort of fundamental because when we're moving, however we're moving, and whether it's in air or water or mud or, or whatever else, we've got to push against something uh, to get this re reaction force that moves you forwards if you're trying to go forwards. Um, so in water, you've got to push against the water. In air, you've got to push against the air. Um, and on the ground, when I'm walking around, I'm, I'm pushing against the ground, whether that's concrete or grass or a big sloppy mud puddle. Um, so obviously, they, they fundamentally determine how an animal is moving. Uh, we're fairly lucky in that the physical constraints, they're constant through time. Moving through water today is the same as moving through water 200 million years ago. And the same with air. Maybe there's a little difference in air pressure. I don't know. But it, as far as we're concerned, right, it's basically the same. And, and that applies today. So we can look at a whale and a fish, and they're very different. One's a mammal, one's a, a fish. And they're moving through this fluid, this, this medium water, and they have the same environmental challenges to overcome. You've got to move the water out of the way. You've got to push against it, but it moves. And so the, the, the principles are the same. But then we can have these really subtle effects as well. Um, and, and you mentioned walking on different substrates, which is my area of uh, real interest. And so if you go walking down the beach and you, you go for a jog, in the dry sand versus the, the firm wet sand, you're going to jog differently. Right, your either your well, your limb motions are going to change a little bit. The speed you can go at changes. The acceleration you go at changes. Um, these all have a fundamental effect on how you move, um, and especially if you start walking across a deep muddy field, right, your willy's going to get stuck in there, and you're going to be walking in a completely different way than you would uh, on 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 firm grass, for instance. So, for, as far as um, consulting for life on our planet. Uh, yeah, the flight and the, and the swimming, we can look at modern animals and we can compare those kind of things. Uh, I don't think there's many instances where the substrate type directly affects the locomotion. Um, you'll often notice that when we're dealing with CGI animals, the feet aren't always clearly shown interacting with the substrate because it's really difficult um, from an animation and biomechanics perspective. But there are instances where these animals are moving through softer substrates, and that was all taken into account. The kind of no, actually, the limb, the limb would slip a little bit in this kind of substrate, and that's going to slow it down a little bit when it's trying to move forwards. Um, so yeah, all of those things from these big scale, yeah, it was swimming or it was flying, and therefore it has these these fundamental principles. Down to these, well, it's walking on this kind of loose, dry sand, so it's moving a bit differently. All of those things needed to be considered. Um, when looking at these things in the early stages. Tell you what, I did notice it. Uh, and where I noticed it most was the, uh, the fisher pod, the, the fish that was trying to get up onto mm. land, and that was scooping its fins against the mud and having a little slide forward as it lurched. And I did notice that the mud was deforming around its fins, and I was like, ah, I've yes. done it. <laughs> I was really happy to see that. Excellent. Um, but how much does the 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 biomechanics depicted? How much does that contribute to the believability of a CGI scene? Like, can we instinctively tell if something is wrong, if something's off? And then I guess, like, just in general, how important is it to get it right? It seems really obvious to say you want the animal to look right when it's moving. Um, but you may, you, your listeners may be familiar with this concept of the uncanny valley. And if you have, say, a static 3D model or even a photo of a, a human's face and it's not quite right, things get more and more realistic. And then all of a sudden we have this weird ability to know something is not quite right. And the same happens with motion as well. So if it's really off, you can kind of let it pass. You know, you look back at the old documentaries from the 80s or 90s, and it's kind of like, yeah, fine, whatever. Um, but then as things get better, you start to note it just feels off. And most people wouldn't be able to say exactly how it's off. It just looks wrong. And we're going through the, the uncanny valley with the motion. So 
as our models, as our digital models get better and better, it becomes more and more important to really nail the biomechanics and the motions as much as it is physically modeling the, um, the, the organisms in the first place. So yes, we can generally instinctively tell, even without um, you know, research expertise in biomechanics, people can tell when something's not moving in a realistic way. Um, yeah, so it's, it's super important to get it right. Otherwise, it does look like uh, a bad video game or something where you've got these beautifully textured models moving around and they're not moving around realistically. Um, mm. I, would, I would highlight some of the Bethesda games as a, a great example of that, right? Starfield and Skyrim, if your listeners are into that kind of thing. They have these beautiful textures and the models are really nice, but they move really quite badly. <laughs> the animations don't, don't work well and it, it sticks out quite a bit. So yeah, for something like this, it's super important to get it right. Have you ever done any kind of like computer game consultancy? Because as, as we were saying, like, you know, like you could apply this to whatever. You could do that yeah. for computer games. Are you open for consultancy should uh, Bethesda uh, uh, <laughs> to be listening? I certainly am. And I'm sure it would be exactly the same sort of process as this, where uh, it's sort of an iterative process where you get shown early designs and you can point out oh, this thing needs improving and this thing isn't quite right. And then the animators can go away and implement that. And sometimes they might come back and say, no, actually, we need to keep it this way because if we do what you're saying, it's not going to work with fitting into the scene. And that's, that's fair enough. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so then as, as with your job as a professor as biomechanics, is your uncanny, uncanny valley more of you know, like a canyon? Is it massive? <laughs> and, and then wh what are some of the worst culprits and what are some of the common things that they get wrong? I mean, for me, when I think about bad CGI, things feel like they don't have any weight to them. And the thing that really gets me is when um, models slide across a surface. So they'll mm. have like a, a walk cycle, but they'll just slide across a surface as they're doing it completely. Yeah, right I mean, given my, given my research focus on, on footprints and, and foot sediment interactions, I'm, I'm super sensitive to exactly what you say, that sliding foot where the foot isn't really interacting with the ground and then it feels like this whole eight-ton animal is just magically suspended and stroking the ground as it walks. Mm. Um, the other thing that, that sort of really... Um, triggers me that I notice is when people make an animal deliberately massive and, and look heavy, right? Think about a T-Rex in some bad CGI you might have seen. It stamps down really hard, but then to get that stamp on the next step cycle, it has to lift up again really high. And so you end up with this really bouncy gait and it doesn't make any sense because this thing weighs eight tons. It can't be lifting eight tons up and down. That's just wasted energy. Um, so yeah, things like that do stand out. I don't know that I'm any more sensitive to it than other people. Um, and I think maybe I just have refined tastes. Maybe a lot of the CGI, <laughs> maybe the, a lot of the things I'm watching with CGI dinosaurs and monsters in um, tend to be good films and games and things. Well, um, the the biomechanics in Life on Our Planet is is quite good. I feel there, there, there wasn't anything <laughs> high praise indeed. <laughs> no, I was just trying to think of how to phrase it. It was good uh, in the fact that I didn't notice it. And yes. that I think is the highest praise that you can give in, in a way. It didn't feel too like it, it wasn't present. I wasn't thinking about I it. I think that's a really just, great observation. Yeah. I think Thanks for understanding. <laughs> no, I think that's exactly right. And I'm sure that this applies not just to the animation and how these things are moving, but it applies to the details on the models as well, right? Somebody probably spent several days adding tiny little hairs and scales in places that you might not notice. And it doesn't mm. stand out immediately, but if you got rid of them, everything would look less realistic. And I'm sure it's the same with the biomechanics and the animal motion. That yeah, 
if you're not noticing it, the animators have done their job properly. I wonder if that's really... How, how would I put it? It's like, it's your job to make, to put so much work into it that nobody knows that you've done anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I can probably, if I spent time, draw par parallels to lecturing as well, where if you do a really <laughs> good job, the students are learning, but they're not, right? They're not thinking, oh, that was super entertaining because they were learning. They weren't just being entertained. So yeah, it might be, might be the same thing. Um, but yes, it's, um, I guess you can take pride in your work if you're an animator or a digital sculptor and things like that, when people just accept all of these details and motions and things like that as being very realistic and very good. Yeah, same for podcasting as well. <laughs> I think we've, we've done a good job and everyone's learned stuff uh, in a fun way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And nobody has any idea of all the effort you go to afterwards. All all of the editing that we've had to do to make this possible. <laughs> but thank yeah. you thank you very much for your contribution to this episode. It's been wonderful My speaking to you. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Bonus bonus questions at the end because we got talking. It sounded good. The audience want to hear this, I think, because I think this is a really good conversation. Right. Yeah. Are physical effects always going to be better than CGI? I think so, but I'm middle-aged. <laughs> so, um, I, I don't know what other people would say, but to me, certainly, physical effects have something about them that's just uh, more tangible, right? Literally, more tangible. Uh, and, and you go back 30 years, that T-Rex from Jurassic Park is still somehow one of the best T-Rexes ever on screen. And that's because they built a giant robotic T-Rex and then filmed it correctly in the dark with rain and everything. And it looks superb. Um, and a modern example, you know, even, even when your physical models aren't maybe technically as accurate as your digital models and you can't do as much with them, audiences kind of accept it. And, and the best example of that recently is Baby Yoda from The Mandalorian, right? It looks like a small puppet, but it also looks better than CGI would have done because it's interacting with the environment and the actors. I guess it's, it's more important for a show where you've also got real people and environments in there, where everything's built digitally. Maybe you can get away with it a bit more. I thought Baby Yoda was CGI. It might have become CGI later, but in the first series, a lot of it was, was practical. It was, it was a puppet. Um, there's a great quote from one of the actors in there. that's like, use the puppet, you cowards, when they tried to use some of the, some of the CGI on it. Uh, and rightly so, <laughs> right? It looks, it looks tangible. It's something people can pick up and move around. Um, and it's adorable. Yeah. <laughs> and for me, like the, the epitome of good... Uh, effects will always be the thing. Like oh the, gosh, yes, absolutely. That still stands up very well after all this time, doesn't it? It really does. Like, okay, you can tell that some of the heads are a, a bit, you know, like spongy painted, right? And that whatever. comes back to that comes back to that uncanny valley we were talking about earlier. That that we're really sensitive to it on faces, but when you have the thing not having a face front and center. It's superb. Yeah. <laughs> the paleontology thing crossover. Oh, you know it needs to happen. All right. I think Netflix <laughs> are listening, so. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> to be released in 2030. I'm on it. <laughs> Let's do it. All right, cheers. <laughs>